Welcome back everyone to the first episode of 2022. I hope the new year is off to a great start for all of you listeners. Well, what do you think of when you hear the following? Horsesport.com, horsecanada.com, and canadianthoroughbred.com. Well, if you are like me, you think of these three publications owned by the Horse Media Group as the go-to source to get caught up on everything important and informative going on in the equestrian industry. The aforementioned websites enjoy an audience over 1 million users and the brands are followed by over a half a million people on social media. Today, I am fortunate enough to have with me Jennifer Anstey of CEO of the Horse Media Group. Jennifer has extensive experience in all aspects of the horse industry with a keen understanding of its commercial, sport, and recreational facets. Jennifer has reported on major international events, including the Olympics, World Equestrian Games, Pan Am Games, and World Cup Finals. Welcome, Jennifer. Good morning. How Thank are you? you? For having me. Oh, you're I'm great. Good. <laughs> you're very, very welcome. I'm happy to have you here. So how's your 2022 going so far? So far, so good. Uh, my, uh, what we talked about earlier, really, but my challenging with my flooding basement. But aside from that, I've been out riding, so that's good. Excellent. Yes. Yeah, so deal with the flooding basement later. Yeah. <laughs> put that aside for now. Yes, exactly. All right, Jen, to start us off, can you give us a brief history of the Horse Media Group and also give us a bit of your own history within the company? So Horse Media Group was started back in 1978. My mother and my aunt, Alice Ferrier, purchased um, the Corinthian, it was called then, from the Horse Show Association as a bankrupt publication. Hmm. And mom was recently divorced and needed a new gig. And so they decided that they were going to start uh, this, this magazine, which blew up and became very popular um, and she um, then added different publications over time. She bought different publications, folded them together um, to create bigger publications. So she built, so Corinthia became Horse Sport and then we added, um, it, at first it was Canadian Horseman which became Horse Canada and also Canadian Thoroughbred along the way. She started the Canadian Horse Annual um, and then all the various websites. She was really keen on doing the websites really, really early. So that's, um, that was really good to start for our brand online. And um, I was never interested at all in the company. Really? <laughs> I saw how mom worked, no kidding. I saw how mom worked ridiculously hard and it looked like far too stressful for me. I was gonna be a physiotherapist. Oh. Um, and um, I was working, um, I, uh, through school and mom came to me one day and she said, listen, I'm going to sell this company, uh, unless you come on board. Cause I need some help. And I was like, Oh, <laughs> and I was with a girlfriend at the time. I was living with a girlfriend and I said, Oh, geez, you know, I've got this opportunity. And she, she's heavily involved in the horse world. And she said, you know, you're never going to get this chance again. Try it. If you hate it, you've tried it and you can say thanks, but it's not for me and you can move on. But if you don't, then you maybe you'll always wonder. So I thought, yeah, that's sound advice. Um, so I tried it and I loved it. Wow. I started off um, in sales. I started a classified magazine um, and then, um, you know, slowly took over more aspects. My mom became ill. So I took up over, you know, the management and um and then mom passed away and it became my thing and i i love it it's it's a lot of fun wow so did you have any experience within journalism or were you... nothing wow not a no i wasn't i wasn't a keen um writer i mean i was okay at it i you know but i i um i just i wasn't interested in it I, I liked horses. I liked the industry. I always participated that way. But I guess, you know, everybody shows their joy in different ways. In retrospect, I, as an adult, understand that mom loved her job. As a child, it looked horribly stressful to me, but she loved it. 
Um, I'm always careful to tell people like I, I work really hard and I work a lot, but I love what I do. And so I always tell my son, you know, I'm working hard, but believe you me, I love what I'm doing. Like, this is a lot of fun for me because I want him to know that, yes, it's stressful and there's a lot of work that goes into it, but I wouldn't change it. Wow. That's great. And what you said a little back about, you never get this chance again. And if you don't try it, you'll never know. That is so pivotal. Like how many people are in that position and just go, mm, no, I don't think so. I'm comfortable here. I'm, I, I have this spot, but to take that chance and look what you showed yourself. Yeah. I'm forever grateful for that girlfriend who Shona Ferry, who, uh, who said, you might know Shona, um, but who, who, who said that and it changed my life. And, and so I always kind of, you know, put that lens on like, well, maybe it's whatever project doesn't interest me, but you know, there's no harm in trying. And if I don't like it, then I can say no, thanks. Did you give yourself a certain time frame, like a certain commitment, like six months, a year? No, I didn't. I, I Because I didn't know that I would like it. I came into it and just thought, well, let's see what this is about. And, um, and I, I was young at the time. I was, gosh, 24, maybe something like that. And I was just at a university and I, you know, so I kind of, yeah, I, I, I thought, oh, well, I'll try it. If I don't like it, then I'll try something else. Nice. Um, but, you know, mom gave me that project of starting that magazine and it was really my baby. So I, I got, I was fully responsible for it. And that, that made it really entertaining and fun. Awesome. Wow. I'm sure all of us and all of the loyal listeners and, and viewers of website are very happy that you decided to, to take this on. And another interesting thing you said, that's so cool that your mom had the foresight of the online and the internet well yes. before it became necessary. Wow. Yeah, she was, uh, she was really big on it. And in fact, and this is back, you know, mid 90s. She, I remember having this conversation with her then, and I wish I'd invested in it then, but she was like, this Google thing, this is, this is a big deal. And I, we, we, we need to be that for the horse world. And I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> well, let me get on that. <laughs> um, but she, she, she was really um, ahead of her time that way and understanding the value of different technologies um, and how they could impact the world and, and, and her business as well. Wow. That's great. So let's get into some, the nitty gritty stuff here. How do you deal with building momentum in different areas of your life that can be contradictory to each other? So is there any one ideal way to achieve harmony between personal and professional? What do you think about that? So what's interesting is, um, I don't have contradiction in my life. Wow. Um, I know. I mean, I, it's not to say they don't have challenges, but my life is, it, it, my personal, my professional life are, are interchangeable. Uh, my friends or my colleagues or my workers, I, they, I, they're all horse people. So I'm one of those really, really lucky people that I don't really work per se. I don't have a job. I love what I do. I think about it when I go to bed. I'm like, oh, what am I going to do tomorrow? So, um, you know, and going going to ride my horse, that's that's like part of my job, really. I, you know, being part of the industry, going to a horse show. Yeah, that's my job. Going to the Olympics, getting to watch these amazing, amazing riders. It's It's personally fun. And, um, but it's also my job, which is probably why I love my job so much. <laughs> yeah. And that's kind of how I feel with the massaging, right? Like when I go to a client's barn, I feel like there's a connection with the client. I'm not just there to provide a service transaction with the horse. I'm, I don't know. I, I love all my clients. You, you know, you get to hang around an animal you love all day and research and find out more about it and stuff. So yeah, that's great. I can totally relate to how you feel about what you do. Yeah. And so, I mean, I'd love to provide, you know, some insight about how to handle contradiction, but I, I, um, my only insight would be that I, I, um, I love everything. It, it, it all works together. It's one, it's not a work life and a home life. Um, it's all one life. Wow. I, I'm not sure a lot of people can say that. 
no, they can't. And, and, it, and it wouldn't work for a lot of people. Um, but um, I, it does for me. <laughs> <laughs> what about your timing? If it all sort of melds together, is there a certain timing that you're like, okay, this is family time? I, do you block time I do. for that? Yeah. So um, on the weekends, um, you know, I have a 10 year old son and I want to hang out with him. So I do create activities that we can do together. Um, or, you know, it's the winter now, so we're skiing together. So on the weekends, I do ski. Now in the morning when I wake up, I'm still reading all my emails and keeping up with work. Um, but it's not work because I you know it's interesting what's happening over in Europe right now who won which horse show um but I do make sure that I have time for my family and um yeah so I guess I I block off uh, off the weekends because that's when he's not in school yeah yeah nice all right so what has been the most significant event or topic that you've covered with horse media group and what about something that was underrated and yet still left a big impression on you? So being present for the Team Silver and Eric's individual gold in Hong Kong um, at the Olympics was huge. And it was an amazing experience that even at the time, I knew that it would never be replicated. So what happened during those Olympics um, so the equestrian portion of the events were held in Hong Kong. So it was the Beijing Olympics, but equestrian was in Hong Kong because the quarantine issues with the horses. And everybody was all together in one hotel. All the countries, except for, the, if I recall correctly, I think it was the Americans had their own, their own place somewhere else. But every country was in one hotel. And every night, everybody would be downstairs drinking, having a great time, celebrating medals, um, celebrating good rounds. It was, it was incredible. It's an experience that I knew that I wouldn't get again because typically at, um, at the major games, every, all the countries have their own houses and their own um, groups and they don't really interact. It's really, um, you know, being very professional about it. And not to say that it wasn't then, but it, it was just a different environment. And so it was really fun to be part of that, to be part of Eric's celebration and be part of, you know, the team celebration. That was so special. Wow. Um, and in terms of underrated stuff, so the horse sport has covered um, a lot of endurance, um, a lot of the issues with the, with endurance riding. And I, it, because it's such a ugly topic, um, a lot of people choose not to, you know, really dive into it, but it's so important that we keep the spotlight on the horses and what's happening and hold people to account for their actions. So I'm really proud to have, um, had amazing writers like Pippa Cuxon covering it on, on our behalf and on our website. Um, it's unfortunate that not everybody has the same level of care that we have for our horses, um, but um, we have to let people know what's happening and then maybe get them to change their minds. Okay, so, so something like a topic like this, you want to inform and educate Mm -hmm. and deal with reality, but also look at the better aspect of the discipline? Yeah, so with endurance, um, a, a lot of the riders um, in the Middle East don't have the same um, values that we have. Um, they they, they um, they don't treat their horses well, not all of them for certain, but there's a lot, there's a lot of, uh, all you have to do is look at the FEI um, tribunal cases and 90% of them are drug violations with uh, endurance horses. Mm -hmm. And so I think our role is to say, hey, this is happening. I know it's on the other side of the world, but it's under, you know, it's, it's, it's happening to horses. It's happening in, as an FEI sport. We really need to make this better for the horses and 
and hopefully then the riders will come along and say, you know what, we can do this, we can do this better. We can, there's a different way of doing this so we can be part of this community that we really love, um, but do it in a, in a way that's more respectful to the horses. Yeah, wow. Yeah, like really just trying to, to educate. And like you said, hoping like there is an ethical part to the reporting too, right? Mm -hmm. And especially when you're dealing on a topic of animals and like everybody that's tuned in to what you guys are putting out there obviously loves the horses and this becomes mm -hmm. a real like heart to topic and then passion and emotion takes over. So you, you want to discuss it and do you try to temper it a little bit or just keep it at an educational type of approach? Some of them, I mean, some of the violations are so egregious, there's no tempering it. I mean, swapping out horses in the middle of a ride, um, giving horses drugs so that you know, to mask problems, um, you know, threatening officials because they're trying to uphold the rules. There's no, there's no balance in that. They, these are the facts, yeah. they're not cool. Um, but you know, the FBI is working really, really hard to, to bring them in line and, and to show them a different way. And there's, um, there's a, actually a venue out in the middle East that is doing exactly that. They are, they're running, uh, events that are respectful of the animals and of the rules. And so it's just, I think if, you know, as the role of the journalist is to, to say, Hey, this one way that you're doing it, it's not acceptable. But here's another way that is acceptable. Hopefully, eventually, over time, with bad publicity of the of the bad, they they will migrate to the good. But if if nobody shames them, perhaps, or or mm -hmm. shows them that that's not the way it should be, then they're just going to continue doing what it is, when doing making bad practices and bad decisions. That must feel good in your role to know that you can initiate change in such a positive way. Yeah, I, 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 that's part of, you know, what I, I love about my job. I, I love finding out the issues um, and investigating them and, and kind of coming with solutions. I, I, uh, I do a lot of, you know, well, with Equestrian Canada, I tend to be um, very critical, but because it's such an important role, but I like to, I, I like showing them, you know, these are the problems that you might need to address to make the, it a better organization so that uh, it, it's here for years to come and can support riders and our industry and encourage more people to have horses because they're wonderful. Yeah. Yes. They're good for the soul. They are. Um, yes. Great. Cool. All right. So how do you go about setting goals for a company with a global reach? It's that time of year. Everybody this, you know, starts setting goals in January for what's going to happen for the year. And what is the blueprint you use for personal goals? So for the company, um, it's uh, um, all of the different brands. It's about finding the, the big stories, making sure that we are on top of the stories, um, making sure that we are, you know, say, informing everybody. Um, that's what the readers want. They, they, they look to us for, for their Canadian content and we do profiles and we cover hot topics. Um, uh, so I, I have to keep involved so that I know what the stories are and just keep delivering those. So there's, that's the journalistic end and on the you know the background end i'm looking at the websites from a technical standpoint and making sure that they are as uh, robust as they can be as user friendly as they can be so i um i i, I kind of ha have a priority list of like these are the projects that i want to accomplish and i divide it up like i know at certain times of year i'm i'm going to be busy with um horse shows or, or whatever else is going on. So I kind of slot that in, slot those projects in, in between. Um, personally, um, I don't, I can't, 
do I have personal goals? Because a lot of my personal goals are tied up with my company goals. Um, I suppose, you know, I did say that I want to do more horse show competitions. So it's a matter of, okay, so last year I, I didn't do as many as I wanted because I didn't plan properly. So I knew this way, this year that I had to, okay, I have to be, to get my horse fitter earlier. So that's part of my priority. And um, so come March time, um, when my horse is fit and um, my trainer's back from Florida, um, <laughs> then I can start, uh, you know, really jumping into it and kind of sitting down with them and saying, okay, which horse shows are you going to, which ones work with my schedule and, um, and going about it that way. That's great. I mean, there's so many of us that have known you for so long that are so excited to see you back in the ring. Right. Yeah. That's <laughs> I love it. I, I love going back to the horse shows and you know, it's shocking. It's just, you know, uh, it, it's fun to see the, 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 the evolution because I'm now at that point where I get to see the kids of the friends that I, I grew up with and now we're watching them in the pony ring and it's, it's just, it's amazing. Yeah. That's cute. Yeah. I know for, for one of the things that I've been talking about and you hear other people talk about, like, do you have a word or, or a statement for the year, right? So like, let's say a couple of years ago, my statement for the year was do it different. So whatever I'd done before, something came up to question me, I'd be like, okay, just do it different, Trace. And then this year I was kind of toiling between three words, focus, intention, and creative, you know, that kind of thing. So I, I tend to you know, like what's, what's one word that I can just sort of use as my goal oriented word. So, so maybe that's something you can, you can think of to, yeah, yeah to kind of get you on there and figure that out with your horse and get you on your goals. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I do. I, I want to have um, more time in the ring. So I do need to, maybe I think intentions rings with me, like have, yeah. you know, intention, just make it happen Yeah, and plan accordingly. Yeah. Sounds good. <laughs> so getting, you know, prepared for this and learning more about you, I realize how much volunteering you do. So why is volunteering so important to you? You give so much of your time to many organizations outside of your work that is horse related. So is it fair to say that your passion for equestrian sports represents a large part of your identity? Yeah, it really does. Um, I, I spent a lot of time on different uh, horse organizations, most because I, I enjoy it. I right? like, I, I like to know what's going on and I like to, to contribute to this industry that, that has given me so much. And that sounds just so cliche, but it's true. It's my life. And I, and I really do love, it. and I'm, I'm incredibly grateful for it. And so really want to help give back. Now what's interesting. And um, I'm not even sure if I, if I included this on my resume that I sent, but um so I did realize a few years ago that my entire life is very much horses. <laughs> um, and so I thought, you know, I think I'm getting, you know, very uh, one-sided. I think I need to expand and diversify a little bit. So I started um, just getting involved in community groups and uh, in just in my, my little town of King Township. And I really enjoyed that. Um, and so I've become really quite passionate about uh, community issues. And um, mostly, I mean, ultimately it's kind of funny because it still stems from horses because I'm worried that our area is going to be developed. And if, there, if it's developed, there's no place to ride horses. So, and I'm also worried about my water for my horses. So it, it, it does kind of, if, work together with with my my love of horses but it's completely separate nobody there knows anything about horses or or you know they're that's not their main focus in life it's really the community and I enjoy that so um I've um I I I, I volunteer a lot with horses but I have started to do more volunteering outside of the horse world as well 
I, when you said that your, your whole life, when you just kind of went, wait a minute, everything in my life has to do with horses. I was there too. I don't know, maybe like 10 years ago and everything in, in my house is really horsey and all my friends and everybody <laughs> and what I do every day. And I was kind of like that. I'm like, maybe I need to expand my horizons. And that's when I found motorcycle riding. So the <laughs> Ah. So that definitely got me out of the whole horse world in a different way, riding a different horse, I guess, of <laughs> horsepower. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it really served me well for that. I don't know, just meeting new people, talking mm. about different things you don't talk about every day and just different types of friendships. And, and like you said, it's different kind of community surrounding yourself with different people and learning about different things. It was, it's so much fun. I agree. I really like, um, I really like getting to know the people in the community outside of the horse industry and, and um, getting involved in community issues. And because I, one of the things that I found that is so amazing is that you can have an impact um, within your small community just by speaking up because municipal politics isn't the sexiest thing on the planet, <laughs> but it's important and, yeah. and you can make a difference. Well, I think what you're doing is so important because, you know, I go, I'm up in your neck of the woods a lot and still go up there for a lot of clients and driving around those roads it's just beautiful and yeah. you're right it's what every time I up there it feels like whoa okay there's another house going up there's another subdivision going up and it gets a little mm. scary it is it is scary and 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 so you know with that in mind I want to I want to preserve it I love I love the countryside and I really worry that it's going to disappear unless more people stand up and say, hey, wait a minute, that's not what we want. And, you know, during the pandemic, people, you know, came out. So I ride along the, along our road and I, I had to stop during the pandemic because so many people would come up from the city and they park on the road to enjoy some of the trails that are nearby, which is fabulous, but they don't know road etiquette. So I remember one time riding along the road and this somebody in some fancy car comes flying by me and I was saying, slow down, slow down. And he thought I was waving. So he went by, hi, like, no, you're going 80 kilometers an hour on a dirt road. Could you just slow down a little bit? So it just became a bit dangerous, but um, yeah, it, it, it um, I got to uh, at least ride during the pandemic ra rather than um, being stuck at home and uh, being outside, which is what was really important. Yeah, good, good. So with everything going on in your life, how do you get your horse fix? What does a return to competition for Jen Anstey look like? So I, well, as I said, so I have my horses at home, which is so incredible. I mean, yes, it's a lot of work, but um, the ability to get up in the morning and go ride, um, go for a hack, um, which I really love doing. Um, it, it, it's, that is so important to me and is so great for my own well-being. I can feel the tension. I, I, a girlfriend keeps her horses at the, at the barn and she and I, if we, well, for whatever reason, can't get to ride for four or five days it's subtle, but the, the tension that is, it kind of builds up. And, and even though it's hard and you're busy or whatever, if you just make the time and go to the barn, I can feel it just go away. I can feel the tension ease. So um, I, I am now making more time to go ride to get my horse fit. And now it's not, you know, just this gentle walk through the woods. Now I'm like, okay, I've got to, I've got to be really more focused about this. Yeah. Um, and thankfully there are some hills by the house so I can hack up and down there for fitness. Nice. Um, um, so yeah, so we talked about earlier, like I want to get my horse fit. I want to set a plan. Like these are the horse shows I'm going to go to um and see what I can do I'm I'm a I love my horse um and we have a lot of fun together and bless him he makes up for all of my little errors um so I can't overdo it um but um yeah well I'll I'll come up with a plan in in March I I that's when I think well it 
it'll happen. Nice. Yeah. Like, do you find that, you know, Jen, who you are now looking back, because when you said, you know, you really enjoy that getting up in the morning and spending that time with your horse, you know, and when you're not doing what feeds your soul, you start to feel that, you know, itch, that little something that doesn't feel comfortable. How long did it take you to learn that about yourself? Because there's so many of us that, you know, fight that. And even though we know it would be better for us and healthier mentally, physically to go and do what we need to do for ourselves, we often put it off for everybody else. So how did, how did Jennifer come around that for yourself? And when did that really kick in for you? Wow. Yeah, I am. Um... It did take years, really a long, long time to, I, I, I was, I, I, before I had a family of my own to, to care for, I, I rode all the time. So that tension didn't build up, but then, you know, when I was pregnant and then, you know, I've got a new son and I got the company and, and this, that, and the other thing. And I, I didn't get back in the saddle for, for a long time. Um, but then when I, I started to make that time, I, I recognized how much of a better person I was. Ooh. Some people, they like to run. Um, that wasn't my thing. It, horses and, and riding are, are my thing. It's the riding is the only time when the brain isn't going. You have to focus on your horse. And that's what I found is why I love it so much because I, 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 I'm forced to stop thinking about everything else and I think about the horse and so that took me probably until I was you know almost 40 yeah. <laughs> to really recognize how important that was for me and and then to and then to make that time to make that happen that's so cool what you described almost sounds like an act of meditation right it is in a way yeah. it is I I um because some but yeah, I, I recognize it and I feel it. Uh, I don't know how to describe that, but I can feel everything just relax a little bit. And when it's happening, I can feel the tension going away. And the, it's not even just tension, it's rebuilding. It's getting stronger again. Um, not that I was weak before, but it, it rejuvenates me. That's awesome. Good for you. And I know this is going to resonate with so many people listening to this because the, the conversations around self-care and personal development and the people that, that don't take the time, make the time for themselves, commit to that. It really starts to affect us as individuals, as a community. Um, so yeah, kudos to you. That's awesome. Yeah. The, 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 I, I work out in the morning. So I'm, while I'm not, my first love is not being a morning person. I recognized early on that a at night, I'm definitely not working out. So I get up early and I work out and it does start my day well. And so for me, it was recognizing that even though I don't super love getting up early in the morning, I can, if I do that, that one thing makes the day better and it makes gives me more energy makes me feel better about myself so it's whether whether it's working out because it's too dark to ride in the morning before work and getting the child to school <laughs> and uh you know then I go down to the barn or go pat the horses or whatever but I'm up I make that commitment to get up early and 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 then everything kind of goes smoother from that sounds great sounds like a great plan <laughs> awesome so tell us about your mom, Susan Jane Anstey, and what yeah. it's been like to take her legacy and turn it into your own. Yeah, daunting. <laughs> that was a daunting um, proposition. I was excited because I was young and, and I didn't know better. So, um, you know, when she, she brought me on and, and she was going to, you know, semi-retire and I was going to keep doing it. It was fun and exciting. And then it was like, oh no, your mom's gone. Now it's yours. Make this work. Um, that was, that was, that was a bit daunting, but um, I, th I, I had phenomenal staff um, that were so supportive and helpful. And 
Um, so I, they made it fun, and, and I always, I always liked it. So they, I took away the the stressful factor of it. Um, Mum was a force. Um, she was so strong, and um, oh gosh, uh, so smart. And I, I, I think that was part of the reason why I didn't think that I could do this job. I was like, gosh, I, I, I'm, I am not that woman. I, I, I don't think I could hold a candle to her. Mm. Um, but you know, when you're put in a position, you'll be amazed what you can do. <laughs> you just make it happen. And, and, and I did. So I, um, you know, I, I love the magazines, but obviously I had to make the transition to do digital. So I made, I, I spent two years going through the numbers, losing money, going, going through the numbers saying, I've got to make this work. I've got to keep these magazines going, but I, eventually I just, I can't, it's not going to, it's not going to happen. And so coming to terms with the fact that I was going to have to shut down the magazines that my mother had started Ooh. was fairly horrific, wow. <laughs> very emotional. Um, yeah, very challenging. But at the same time, mom was a, a, an amazing business person. And I knew without, uh, there was nothing that I had done wrong. It's just the changing landscape. And my mom would have been like, well, she, first of all, she would have probably said, Jennifer, you're ridiculous for doing this as long as you have, you should have made this decision long ago, but whatever, <laughs> such is life. Um, uh, then creating this new company based on, on websites and gosh, you know, we, I was able to transition um, and have a graceful exit before COVID. But then COVID hit right as my last magazine went to press and I'm now a digital company in a time when everybody's stuck at home. So that transition turned out to be quite fortuitous, mm -hmm. you know? Um, uh, so it's, it's, it's worked out quite well. I mean, um, I, I still get to do what I love to do, you know, be involved in the horses and, and the industry and, and, and learning more and, and, and all that aspect. Um, and I think mom would be, um, I think, Mom would be fully supportive of, of what I've done because it, it, it was it was in, it was necessary. There was no other option. Yeah. Wow. Like the the word legacy has such a a feeling for me, and and I know like myself and so many of my friends. I can't tell you. I waited every month for that horse sport magazine, and I could hardly wait to dive in. And you know so so grateful for like, and I, for your mom and then you taking the reins, <laughs> no pun intended yeah. and how relevant it's been to the entire industry of Canadian horse people. And, you know, I, I can completely relate to, and I think as we get a little older, we think about what is our legacy and, you know, what do we carry forward from our parents and what do we choose to leave you know, behind as ourselves. And, and um, yeah, I, I mean, I think you've done an amazing job. And I know all Thank of you. us in the industry that, you know, know you, I never had the pleasure of meeting your mom, but I'd heard lots about her. And like you said, <laughs> she was a force. So when she passed, you know, we could feel that loss. And then yeah. I know all of us were like, go Jen, you have <laughs> got this. Thank you. And yeah. So I'm so happy for you. And, and so what do you, what do you think that you, if your mom could say something to you right now, something Susan, G, oh. like, what would she say? What would she say about my life? Gosh, I, I wonder all the time, like, what would mom say? What would she think about this decision? Um, she'd probably have me be more focused than I am. Um, but I don't, I don't mean, I say that, but I, I don't even know what area I could be more focused on. So right. I, I mean, I do, I, I, well, we talked earlier about that work-life balance and, and it, for me, it's kind of all one thing. And it was for mom too. I, I have a very clear memory of, um, 
mom bringing, bringing the mail home. In fact, my first job um, was um, started off opening the mail and then, um, and then I was a collection agent um, and I, I did the mail. And in fact, one of my clients and I loved it, I, I am now the chief stamp licker. So when mom passed away, we spoke and he's like, so you're now the chief stamp licker. I'm like, absolutely. That's what I do. Um, but I don't know. Um, I don't know what mom would have me do differently. I, I, I do kind of mentally always think about that. Like yeah. what would, you know, are, are you, are you doing or proud? And I'm like, I think I am. Awesome. Yes, you certainly are. That's awesome, Jen. Oh, man. All right. So what's your opinion of what the future of equestrian Uh, sport looks like? I looked at that question. I'm like, oh, my word. (laughs) That's a big one. What am I going to I'm like, oh, the the horse industry. um, Gosh, it's changing so much horses are so expensive and they're becoming ever more expensive um I, I i think of the team riders but also i mean with my involvement with canadian thoroughbred i mean the cost of a of a thoroughbred racehorse is is pricey um so i think um and then bringing in my um uh, my community experience so there's going to be fewer spaces that can host horses. The horses themselves cost ever more money. And I find that the people are different. They, 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 they're focusing more on, um, so the, the industry used to be all about competition and going to the horse show, but I find more people are into the, just the pleasure aspect. Like I don't, think I'm going to go to the Olympics and uh but I I enjoy this relationship with this horse and and the joy that that brings me so I feel like that there's going to be a bit of a shift um to um to more recreational um not to say that there will be different kinds of competitions just ones that so you know what a great example is the derbies so the derbies are their competition, but they're fun. They make them um, really entertaining. It's a it's an experience, and I think people are going to shift to 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 that a bit. Um, I, it's all over the place. There's so many different aspects to worry about. I couldn't even tell you, you know. And, and is it a point of worry? Like, are you worried about what's happening? What's in store? Um. I, I do consider it, right? Like I, I do think about, okay, I, cause I want to position my company in a way that it's going to, you know, attract people and, and, and readers. Um, so I want to answer that, but I'm, I'm always kind of micro evolving to that because I, every month I go through, okay, these are the articles that were most read. This is what's intriguing to most people. So I'm, I'm always constantly moving in that little direction. Um, I worry more for this, for, for, for the, for the team riders because they're, they're, the cost of these horses is so great that we've got some amazing riders and they just can't find a horse because, you know, you need a lot of money to find one. Yeah. Um, I'm, I, I, I think of, you know, some of banners that had to, to sell their horses. We have amazing show jumpers that can't get a ride um, because they can't afford it. So I, I worry about, you know, the, the team's position. Um, I think the industry I think it will, will, will be fine. It will it will continue to evolve, but people will still love horses, and they'll still love the, that being outdoors and that connection. Um, but I think it, the the top level becomes ever more unattainable. It's the the recreational aspect is going to continue to grow, which is still. And you know what's really funny? So, Horse Canada focuses on the recreational rider. Or sport is comp- focuses on the competition rider. Um, Horse Canada, um, when it was at magazine, had way more readers than Horse Sport. Really? Because yeah, and I told that to everybody all the time. Um, it's like an iceberg. 
the recreational rider in this country is far exceeds um, the the people that compete at the top. The, the the competition is the is the tip of the iceberg that you see above the water. Um, so uh, that will, I think that that will continue to grow, and I think that people will start to tr you know th really think and focus on their um, their what what brings them joy and it's maybe it's competing maybe it's not competing um but that um that relationship is i think what always brings us back right the, the yeah. peace and joy that the horses bring yeah for sure and i mean i i guess in some ways it's funny you say that you're more concerned about the 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 team riders and stuff and i never really thought about that because i think in another way when you look at property selling and the infringement on space and everything that and with the cost that it's hard to get young kids involved in it in a, in a way that their parents can afford to do it right do, do you yeah. find any of that or no so people will say that it it, it that riding is expensive but um, maybe i'm biased but i don't i don't i don't i so my son when he first um started going to school he wanted to play hockey and he so i became a hockey mom for a few years um and so it cost what seven hundred dollars to um for the rink and then you know then all, all the equipment um so it was you know call that fifteen hundred bucks that's a decent amount of riding lessons. Yeah, that's true. So, yes. and, and, you know, your local tack shop can outfit your, your child with a helmet and a pair of boots and a half chaps for, for less than the cost of a good pair of skates. So I, I, I think the lower ends are fine. Um, I mean, um, I think there's a perception that it's more expensive, but I, I mean, it's, you know, it's not as cheap as a soccer ball and go run in the field. That's for sure. But I consider that there's a number of Canadians that can make hockey uh, their priority. And frankly, riding is more convenient. Hockey practice is, and at least in, in, in where, where I am, it, it, they don't tell you until like two days before. It could be noon, it could be nine, your weekend is shot. <laughs> and you sh you show up, you know, and you do your hour, and particularly during COVID, when you feel so bad. I mean, the kids that are in, still in hockey, they're on on in hockey. They're not in hockey. Yeah. Um. Uh, thankfully, well, now some of the riding schools are open, and, and I think they're staying open, whereas hockey was canceled. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're right, actually, and it's. I think maybe the the cost starts to come into play when you know. They need their first horse or their first pony and and that starts to but i guess if they're that interested and committed and you know have the talent then you know it's something well, that i mean i barns are constantly looking for people to work mm -hmm. so if you are that kid that you know your parents say i don't have the money to buy you a horse but you're committed uh, you can find a job there's no problem in going to a barn. I, I I can name five off the top of my head that would say, if you want to come in, sweep the aisles, muck, but you have to be dedicated. You have to be there in the morning. You have to show up regularly, be on time. But if you're that kind of committed person, you can you, you can ride easily, probably for free. Yeah. Yeah. No, I love that. I think that is a, <laughs> a great final statement to make because I hear you at all the barns I'm in they're they're having a hard time finding workers. So these kids, they want to get in there and get some experience and get some riding time in. That's a, sounds like a perfect explanation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Call the barns, um, participate and, and they, they, they will in, enjoy their time and they'll get free, free saddle time and, and they'll make amazing friends for life. Exactly. Well, Jen, thank you so much for, for joining me today. I know that I was really looking forward to hearing your insight um, from, you know, from, from your viewpoint of, of what you do on a day day to day basis. And basically you, how you live your life as you're, you know, <laughs> involved with everything horse and, and stuff. So this has been wonderful and I'm sure the, uh, the listeners will enjoy it as well. Thank you so much for sharing 
um, a bit of your mother with us. I think that was, <laughs> I think that was wonderful as well. So where can people reach out to you? Um, I know I, I will put all of the websites in the show notes for people to reach out to your to your websites to gather information. If people need to contact you, um, how can they do so? Oh, I'm like the easiest person to get hold of. My email is plastered around the internet. Um, my email is jansty at horse-canada.com. Um, I think it's on all of the websites. Okay. Um, and there's you can sign up for the newsletters on the websites. They're free. Um, yeah. And okay. get in touch. I love hearing. I want anybody that wants to write. Um, I always want new writers. Uh, anybody that, uh, you know, photographers want to be involved. I love, I, I'm, I love hearing um, from people and um, perspectives, ideas, even if you don't have, if you just have an idea for a story, all that stuff. I love talking to people. Oh, that's awesome. And what a great, uh, a great way to uh, get people involved in it too. That's great. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. All right, Jen, thank you so much. Tracy, thank you. I really appreciate it. And I will look forward to listening to all your various podcasts in future. Thank you. Good luck.